Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Kenneth Long and I'm here at the Museum of Contemporary Arts in North Miami, Florida. Today, we're going to check out a documentary film. It's an hour and 15 minutes long. And the title of this documentary is Strange Victory. It touches on top of the racism. It's part of North Miami's program events for Black History Month this month in February. There's going to be a panel discussion afterwards. I'm not going to give it away, so stay tuned. And we will see you shortly. London with Williams the Publisher International and welcome here at the uh, courtyard of uh, the North Miami Museum of Contemporary Art. Funny like I told you, we're having this screen play of Strange Victory. Comic so I'm going to spoil it for you and there will be a discussion panel afterwards and talk to you later. Make me smile with some of the things that I see um, from my perspective as a historian of Europe. Okay? Um, so I, I've taught the World War II quite a lot. Um, and I've taught film in World War II and so forth. So I'm going to just pull out a few themes and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague to give some historical background. Um, so it strikes me that one of the main themes here, and I hope we'll discuss it, is it's clearly a, it's a critique of progress, right? It's a critique of the notion that the 20th century uh, gave us kind of global ideas of progress. It provides us a very clear picture about the ways in which the ideas that motivated Nazism and fascism echo in the U.S., right? after the war, and so the very promise of progress and victory is empty. And I'm sure at the time that was a really controversial perspective, um, and, and we'll hear more about the context in a minute. So maybe we can talk a little bit about this idea or promise of progress and, and, and so-called victory. It also struck me this time watching it, the ways in which Hurwitz, Hurwitz, right? plays with ideas about time. I wrote a book about time, so I can't help it. But that he plays with kind of narrative, and he plays with ideas about past and present, and the ways in which the past echo in the present. There's obviously a lot about the theme of birth, right? And of innocence, but corrupted innocence, who are these children, why these children, are they really kind of blank slates upon which society, you know, infuses all of these fascistic ideologies, right? And, and um, so I hope we can talk about that too. I mean, I could go on and on, I'm thinking about, you know, it's a brilliant film really, especially watching the second time, there's echoes of so many films from the era. It's part documentary, as I understand it, and part kind of made up. But those beginning scenes are so evocative of like fascist Nazi films and Lenny Riefenstahl is trying to the will. I mean, the, 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 the filmmaker himself is clearly playing, or not playing, but it, it's using, right, many um, images from film to make this very powerful series of points. Again, I'll just come back to this idea that the, the war and the so-called victory um, 
really did not allow for progress at all. And one of the things that I read about the film is it was considered a kind of uh, writ large social kind of psychoanalytic critique about humans <laughs> to a large degree. Um, so I'll leave you on that. I'll turn it over to Julio and uh, then we'll come back around and, and I hope we talk all together. Uh, um, it sounds so weird. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, do I need to use the mic? I should use the mic, right? So, that's what I'm Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I also saw the film for the first time this week. Um, as I'm a historian of, of cultural uh, and, and social history in the United States, modern the United States. Um, and there's so many different ways that we can kind of tackle, a note. You know, there's so many deep-seated uh, issues here. Um, but as I was re-watching it now, there, it's really layered. And there's, uh, I want to just focus on two things. There's so many kind of smart references in this film. Uh, some of it even seems to be projecting quite a bit of, of foresight with what's to come, uh, including there's a reference to the, 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 the enemy from within, which is a reference, in two years after this, uh, Joseph McCarthy would give a really important speech of really West Virginia call the enemy from within. Um, that talks about, you know, the calls are coming from inside the house. That is that, you know, national security really is based on, on people telling uh, secrets who are working for the U.S. government. It's kind of fear of, of what our McCarthyism. Um, but there's two things before that that I think are really important to give you the kind of historical context in which I was thinking about this film. The first is the idea of the, fir of the four freedoms. Um, that is FDR's four freedoms. Um, before Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, Earlier, in January of 1941, uh, he gave his speech before Congress, the State of the Union Address, where he talked about the importance of not necessarily being isolationist. Right? So this is before, almost a year before Pearl Harbor, the attack of Pearl Harbor. Um, and he talks about all these freedoms, the four freedoms, um, that are inherent to all people. The freedom uh, of press, um, the freedom of worship, freedom from, uh, from fear, and freedom from it's the fourth one, goodness. Um, freedom from want. Want. Um, this, is, this is largely at this point to come, what the, he, in particular he's interested in providing aid um, to Great Britain. The kind of need uh, to, you know, as, as war is, is, is raging on in Europe, um, the importance of how the United States can't remain isolationist. This will only increase right after December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in. The other thing that I want to know, and that's what I have here because I want to read something, um, is that this film, as soon as I, as I saw it, I wanted to make clear that while this is an important contribution, no doubt, this is also paying homage and tribute to, to black women and men who have been making this argument for a long, long, long time. Um, a hundred years before this, for example, in 1852, um, the formerly enslaved uh, uh, Frederick Douglass gave a speech in Rochester, New York, uh, where he argued, what to the slave is the 4th of July? Um, that is, how can we talk about liberty and emancipation um, when people are enslaved? The kind of uh, hypocrisy, so right, uh, of, of talking about democracy abroad when there is no democracy, right, for the black man and woman in the United States. So I just wanted to read a very small part of, of Frederick Douglass's, um, if you haven't read it, I really, really encourage you to read this. Um, the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable. And the difficulties to be overcome is getting from the latter to the former, and they're by no means slight. I should just say that he was asked to give this um, on, the, on the 76th anniversary of, of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, right? And a lot of people in that audience were very surprised that instead of celebrating the United States, he offered criticisms. Um, more than surprise, I'm sure surprise is not the right word. He later continued, we have to, and this is not an order, I just put a few, a few lines here. We have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and to the future to all inspiring motives, to noble deeds, which can be gained from the past, we are welcome. But now is the time, the important time, and he continued. The evil that men do, it lives after them. The good is often interred with their bones. 
Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty? That he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? So, to, to think about um, the context in which this, is, this all emerges, the hypocrisy, right, of the United States to talk about freedom abroad, democracy abroad, this was not a new argument. And that black women and men have been making this argument for a long, long time. In fact, even a reference, a slight reference, in some ways you could read that, to the title of this film, there was a campaign, um, by, mostly by the black press, that begins in the early 40s, in the midst of the war, called the Double V Campaign. And what it stood for, right, was victory abroad and victory at home. That we cannot lose sight of the kind of problem, right, the very clear racism, anti-black violence, um, and lack of democracy for black folks in the United States, and that we integrate this as a part of the war abroad. That it is to fight and to put ourselves on the line while not receiving any form of, the, the GI Bill that would be passed in 1944 that gave access to education, that gave, for, for people who served in the military, uh, low interest uh, home rates, right? Um, business loans. Many African Americans were denied those same rights, including those who served in the military. What is right freedom beyond, uh, beyond in, in this message? So I want. There's so much more that we can we can talk about. Um, there's there's 1948 is another important year for a number of reasons. Uh, under uh, under an executive order, we would find that the United States would integrate the military. For example, 1948 is an important year because of national politics. We'll see a, a kind of shift in. in a, the, at this point, we've seen the kind of real, we're seeing the realignment of the political parties, the split with the Dixiecrats, and largely about civil rights. There's a lot that's happening just as this very moment in 1948, and one that has a deep-rooted history um, of, of black activism, too. So should we start? Maybe open it up to you. Thoughts, comments, questions? Probably thoughts, questions, questions. The part that really hit me hard, and I felt feelings oozing from the screen, was the gentleman who went in for the fight. And I can sense, Secretary, that if she could have done something to, you know, oblige and give him the job she had. I felt that. I, I felt I felt her pain and that she knew and knew what was going on and I and I love the fact that he addressed it too where he was like, I know the routine. Yeah. And basically, yeah, he's a black man. You know, and, and if he was he could have been, you know, white man, yes, the position would have been open. And the old adage saying of, you know, the more things change, the more they remain the same, that's very real. Because we're in 2022, and racism is still strong, very strong. And, you know, I think of movies that I've watched through the years. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Pacific Heights. And did you see that movie? And, you know, even with that, and, and to show you with that movie, how life comes full circle. That, you know, you can reject or say no to someone today, and two, three months from now, they'll be back in your space again. So with that in the movie, that's just it. You know, the old German, African-American German, oh, you know, no, it's not available. But then they ended up having their issues and having to report it and come to find out he was the officer to the system. So basically, it, it kind of boils down to, you know, you never know who has to help you. And I know from my own experience, I personally could never jump on the bandwagon of, you know, I don't like white people. My grandmother was white. She was disowned by her family when she married my grandfather, who was black and in his chair. And, you know, 
not only that, it's just a matter of there are individuals who were not raised to see color. And so, you know, again, TV shows that you watch, um, the Cosmos, when they had the episode of the word possibly, they were going to be hard on the hood of Ron's car. And of course, you know, they, the students ended up in jail and how the officer, he was like, you don't know who I am. You don't know I could have walked with Martin Luther King. So basically, that's just it. There's, there's a lot of Caucasian individuals who stood on the front lines for us as African Americans, who had their homes burned down too, who were killed as well. So it's basically, you just have to walk the road because that's basically what it is at the end of the day and deal with everyone on an individual basis. Don't cut and put everybody in the same box or boat. You know, if you, if you had an issue on Monday with a Caucasian man, on Tuesday, don't treat the first Caucasian man that you see, you know, with an attitude or, or arrogance. Thank you for that. I mean, I think all of the points that you raised are so echoed in the and in a way, maybe echoed in the kind of juxtaposition of the innocent babies, right, of all different kinds. And so it's like this tension between like what is human and what are the kind of hierarchies of violence that rule societies, whether fascist or so-called democratic, right? Um, and I think in a way, maybe that's what you're getting at that, that Look, whether you look at it in a kind of systemic way or an individual way. And this film, interestingly, does allow for this notion of human innocence at birth. And I don't know, I mean, that's something I don't think about much anymore, to be completely honest with you. I only think about the systemic institutional stuff. It's learned because little boys, little girls, they don't see color. All they know is it's some Lego blocks in the classroom. It's a big old beach ball. Let's play. They don't look at, oh, you're white. I'm black. You're Jewish. I mean, until they walk out of their house. Exactly. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. It's, 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 their learned, house. it's learned behavior. And, and we as adults, we take them and we steal their innocence and we shape shift their minds. And it's not until they get older to detach themselves and relearn what it is to be human, what it is to be kind, what it is to be loving, and the idea that, like the young man wrote to me, and you know, I might be proper, he said, at the end of the day, we're all pink inside. Period. Thank you. I remember when I was doing some research on the film, an interesting fact is the, the actor who played the Tuskegee Airmen who was declined the job. He actually had to leave the United States and he became an expat. There was a group of African-American expats who relocated to Mexico. He couldn't find work in the United States where they had to leave. His name was Virgil Richardson. It's sort of like a weird thing where the story became true. I mean, it's not a story. I mean, Documentary. Yeah. I mean, but the film itself does play with kind of truth and lie an awful lot, right? Mm -hmm. what, did, what did it first comes the word? First comes the word. I don't know where that came from. I know, that, really, yeah. But it's it's hard to look at this. I mean, I've watched the film a few times, yeah. and it's just for me challenging to just think of where we are right now. Yes. And Hugh and Trump and everything sort of in the middle of the United States. And it's as if, I don't know, this, I feel as if this film should be mandatory viewing yeah. throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. so, so. We were saying when we sat down that, you know, this is a film I teach. I mean, but it's also so anachronistic that the, the use of language and fact, you know, facts have changed, but like you said, the more things change, the more they change the same. Uh, the more they stay the same. I mean, I'm sure there's more African American architects now, more African American engineers, you know, 
the deployment remains. The but the point remains the same. It's right. just a very slow creep. We had the whispering. Those, those moments where you have that like, whispering in the background, super powerful. Yes. Yeah, and, and also in terms of thinking about this, you know, a number of black liberation movements of today, so like whether it be Black Lives Matter, I mean, there's, they're making really key parallels um, to, to liberation abroad as well. So the, um, the, the case of Palestine, for example. So you can see a lot of parallels to the ways that liberatory politics, especially around uh, blackness, has long since had a tradition of understanding democracy at home, but also abroad. And you can see lots of parallels. And um, in that way, I think teaching the, the kind of current moment through a film like this would also allow, like, oh, this is, the, you know, this is, for, for exactly what you said, for as much as things have changed, things have also stayed the same. And, and to understand the parallels, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes, right? Like in that kind of way. Like, exactly. What do you do with that? You know, it's like, what do you do with that as a teacher? What do you do with that as a human being living, living in a society? Or do they go home and cry? Well, I think you know? it all comes down to, like, it's, there's three poisons, you know? One of them is ignorance. Yeah. I mean, ignorance is a, you know, is a poison that is out there, and, and there's a remedy for ignorance, but a lot of people just don't want to take the medicine, don't want to educate themselves, because it's easier to just you know, listen to their relatives, and this is the way it's always been. But if you really want to change, you have to apply these antidotes, antidotes I guess, to ignorance. And we have to acknowledge the structures and systems that are stopping those antidotes as well. You know, this access to knowledge isn't as democratic as we want to think that it is. And as much as educators, we want to teach the truth as well as we can within the confines of the boxes that we're given. And those boxes are getting tighter and tighter every day through legislation, through um, systemic oppression of knowledge, and systemic oppression of history. With our past exhibition with Michael Richards, the amount of kids that came into our, our exhibition that had no clue who Tuskegee Airmen were, right. was sad. Yeah. Um, and I think South Florida is incredibly lucky to have mandatory education on the Holocaust starting in fourth grade and up, because when, you know, coming into the United States from Mexico, I didn't have this level of understanding of the Holocaust. That wasn't, that's not, that's not an international level of understanding. And I think that the access to knowledge, while it can be more democratic in the, the web age, of course, who, who's going to tell you what truths are out there? And who's going to show you the line of the true truths or, or those alternative facts? I so feel her in everything she just said. And she is pretty much the epitome of what I see a trigger is. Because she took me back to a poetry class in college. Um, it was about 40 students, um, only three of us African American. And the way the professor did it is she would have us critique each other's poetry. And and I'll never forget it. I thought how long that is. But it goes to show you even then and now that yes, some of us are boxed in. <coughs> we shut out what we don't connect with. So like how she said the German didn't even have a clue of what the Tuskegee Airmen and who they were. This young lady, and she expressed after the fact, she said she had kept having multiple dreams that she was gonna ask a stupid question in the class. <laughs> and um, sure enough, to be honest, you know, we're young kids at that time, you know, late teens. So the gentleman does a poem, and in the poem he says a line by James Brown's soul. So when it was time to ask him questions about his poem, the young lady, she wasn't really young, she was like in her 40s, she said, who is James Brown? And literally, all of us as students, we slid down in the chair like this. Like seriously, we were like, I know she didn't just ask that question. But it goes to show that that's just it. Some people, if it does not, you know, fall into the place of interest for you, and that's across the board with anything, food, you know, um, music, TV shows, you know, even within my own, you know, culture as an African American, I'm a foodie, I don't know what it don't look like. But um, I remember when I expressed, you know, 
having a craving for ambrosia. And sure enough, one of my, you know, peers was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know? So, you, and then you have some, you know, little boys and little black boys and girls that they don't know what a plum is. They don't know what apricots are. And that's because they've never experienced that type of food in their homes. All they know is oranges and bananas and apples. Bang, in the store. It is, it is an important thing, and I, I'll, this is so, such a fruitful conversation, but it, I'm, I'm really grateful for the, you know, the reminder of, of these specific moments uh, of what it meant to be a student in, in a space where you didn't have access, or you didn't have, like you were told something, you were denied not access to knowledge, and to remember, of course, that right now in Florida, as in many other states throughout the country, that black history, black studies are very much under attack as they have been before. Um, uh, under the new boogeyman understood as a critical race theory, right? Um, and that that's it's also not new. That is that the, the, the kind of attacks on black history and, and studies is um, uh, over a century old, as the example I just gave, you know, earlier. But I mean, even even before that, certainly, right? The founding of the nation. Um, so it's it's um, it's important. Yeah. Right? Because a lot of people don't know what that means. Yeah. I think that statement that was said to um, the, he was like, you know, if we won, why does it feel like we lost? You know, right. why the right. Hitler's words still e like echo throughout America? It's the loser's words. And it reminds me a lot of the work that the Daughters of the Confederacy did first in the Civil and then after the Civil War of rewriting history and uh, re idealizing what the meaning of the Civil War was that we are still fighting today. This misunderstanding of, of this idea of states' rights and how it's so misrepresented. It's like states' rights to do what? Right. <laughs> so, it's, it's also just so easy sometimes, like watching this film, to, to not put it in a local context, but that is to remember in South Florida, in Florida, but also in South Florida, Jim Crow was the law of the land. Um, so too was. So uh, there were laws, you know, if this, is, if this film is 1948, it's only in 1964 that the U.S. Supreme Court uh, ruled unconstitutional laws against cohabitation, interracial cohabitation. And it was actually a case in Miami Beach um, of an Afro-Honduran man who was uh, cohabitating with a white woman, and they stormed into his house, and they, they you know, they arrested him um, for cohabitation. That was in 64. And in 1967, interracial marriage, you know, is when it, it, it's, it's deemed unconstitutional to report. 20 years out, almost 20 years after this film. So that is, to, and, and this is, again, happening, that was also the law of the land in Florida. So that is just to kind of put us here locally, too, to, to think that it's not, you know, sometimes people think Florida is outside of the purview of other things, or South Florida, um, you know, Southern and not Southern, and, and all these things, but very much, right? Um, it reads the, it, it, it capitalized, right, on, on Jim Crow racial segregation and violence from the very start. Working with Marianne, 
and the curator, Allison Gingeras, will also be joining us. So, um, thank you, FIU. And um, thank you all. There you have it for everybody. It's Kevin Longman here, and we just had our discussion panel over the movie. As you can see, different people had different points of view, different insight into the film, and what it represented. What are your thoughts on this film? Please check it out if you haven't already. And thank you for viewing. We want to give a special thanks to TATV, Bell Talk Show Magazine, Tele Independence. Canal Blue, 18 Direct, and Hi TV. Thanks for watching. Woo! Thanks for coming out.